Greetings all, Dr. Raphael X here with another video with my friend here, Jeremy. Click on the subscribe button, on the like button, share this video, leave a comment, all that good stuff. All right, so today we're going to talk about the philosophy of the body and how in contemporary times, really in contemporary philosophy, the body has been kind of absolutized. Uh, we have fallen into to a monistic spirit um, before we can kind of say, in Western philosophy, medieval times, you know, <laughs> modern philosophy, it's been really dualistic. And, you, and we see this clearly with, well, with Plato and Descartes too. Rene Descartes was very dualistic. And what's interesting is that, well, extremely dualistic, Descartes. But what's interesting is that one extreme, you know, because we're emotional creatures, we fall from one extreme to the other extreme, or we combat one extreme with the other extreme. So what do we combat Descartes? Descartes' dualism with uh, this contemporary monism, which sees the primacy of the body. We're going to talk about this in, in postmodernism with Foucault. Uh, if we get into the Monty, the phenomenologist. Interestingly, a lot of these, these guys are from France. And, and yeah, talk about how really the body has been taken over. There is no use anymore in contemporary philosophy of talking of uh you know a binary in man that man has a body and a soul and the soul has the primacy right the soul is more important this is in the past today the body has become so important to the point of um overtaking usurping the soul's position that in the sense that all functions or even the immaterial functions traditionally known you know like thinking you know things of that sort of man have just you know, they, they, they just, uh, you know, they point to the body, all that originates in the body, according to contemporary philosophy. So it has totally, the bodily has absorbed the spiritual mental, you know, um, as a extreme response to the mentalism of Descartes, right? So the, the problem with Descartes is that he, he, uh, you know, I think, therefore, I am. He started with the mind, and the criticism is, well, if you start with the mind, you end in the mind, right? You, you, can't, you can't. How do you justify the exterior? So to combat that, right, we prioritize, we absolutize the exterior and hence the body. Well, you want to chime in here, Jeremy? That would be good. You wouldn't mind? Yeah, it's an interesting topic. Uh, we got to figure out kind of what we're going to dial into. And what we're going to focus on, obviously, so many different points of entry. Some summary could be given. Um, I think the defining characteristic of contemporary thought would be that split between the mind and the body. The idea that I'm in here, right? And, and here's my uh, body and the world is out there. How exactly we got to that view would be a... a Question that historians of thought would be best fit to answer. Descartes would be one big name associated with that movement of thought. Um, it, it, what you referred to, um, a reversion back to uh, sort of a, monast a monistic view where it, it is only the body. That's also, I think, uh, representative of many mentalities uh, today, but I think it's more so verbal, oftentimes, meaning a person, if pushed, will say, yeah, uh, my philosophy, my ideology only permits the existence of um, the body, I, only of the brain. I'm nothing more than my body, but for all intents and purposes, I think uh, uh, most people do have that um, division. Well, no pun intended in mind. For example, if somebody loses a limb in a time of war, who would say that there's, say, whatever percent, 20%, 25% less of the person, right? If somebody loses both legs and both arms and even half their brain still, uh, we would say, no, that, that's fully a person. It's as much of a person as there was before. Right? And, and even if I claim that I'm nothing more than my body, if I were to lose, say, half of my body and somebody were to say, you're now you're 50% of a person, you have 50% of the rights that you had, you have 50% of the salary that you had, I would probably say no. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to go with that. Right? And, and then it would follow that I must be something more than strictly my body. Perhaps I'm an epiphenomenon of my body. I'm resultant of bodily processes, but I'm not just 
my body, I would likely then say. Right? And yet this view that a person can be split up into their mind and their body carries with it many problems of its own. For example, there's innumerable issues with the classical um, contemporary views of perception. If there's an object, there's a thing in itself. Uh, there's so-called photons that bounce off of the object and then they enter into the eye and go down the optical nerve and then they're into the brain and they form the image. I so, so many problems with, with such accounts that if we uh, also simply go with the basic dichotomy uh, uh, as suggested by Descartes, uh, body here, mind somewhere here, whatever it might be, there's also very many issues of that. So we can also discuss some interpretations uh, of philosophy that perhaps reconcile those contradictions that would then ensue um, and whatever else comes up. Yeah, no, that yeah, that's that's definitely um yeah, some good points for sure. Um it's uh you know, because Descartes' position, right, he started off with the mind, kind of to counteract that. Um, you know, the materialist, we could say that's with postmodernism or contemporary philosophy, you know, there's even post postmodernism, could let's just say contemporary philosophy, which is a bunch of philosophies put together. It's it's a really kind of like a it's, it's a syncretism for sure, but it's a materialist relativist syncretism where there's a just a whole complicated soup of different ideologies, but it's really saying a lot of what the hedonists said in the past, uh, what the materialists said in the past, right? With the empiricist, right? Empiricism being the um, the epistemology of uh, materialism, which is the metaphysics of the past, but it's these arguments which you're providing for very legit like we can prove the existence of, for, for the soul um, using logic as we did in videos in the in past videos but a contemporary philosophers don't it's, it's they have it's a total different mentality i have to, i've talked to i've talked to um you know postmodernists and they they even think logic is like a some sort of power struggle and right? logic itself is not um something which you know uh which me myself using will would convince someone right we would demonstrate I don't believe in demonstration so it's uh in the, the radical postmodernists so they they don't think in categories of like metaphysics and things like that so they think of categories of power and so Foucault is really interesting in, uh in this part and he kind of and he's following Michel Foucault is following kind of Nietzsche and they absolutize the body as the body being the subject and the object really so everything especially consumerism for example is really the focus is the body right everything is about how the body relates to society right how the body has been um treated throughout history so they're kind of they they rebel against the puritanical view you know they call it right the uh, puritanical view of kind of suppression of the bodily desires and uh they defend right they they propagate the the belief right for the kind of uh, a total freeing of the bodily desires so not only the body the individual we can say the body doesn't serve the individual as it is traditionally uh right as traditionally been taught but the body serves the individual. The body is the instrument. No, the body becomes an end in itself. The individual serves the body, right? So what you're called to do is to, you're, you're called to, right? You're here to, like, this is your whole purpose. And this is, again, hedonism run amok, hedonism justified in a very complex way. You're here for, um, basically fulfilling your body's desires. And we see this very radically in Michel Foucault, who was basically a perverted uh, philosopher, a homosexual, um, justified pedophilia, um, basically any type of, you know, disordered desire that comes from the body. Right? Traditionally, especially we see this with the Stoics, right, Aristotle and, and many classical philosophers, that virtue was uh, the means of obtaining, you know, or fulfilling your, your purpose, right? Virtue comes, we, we naturally... Um, we're, we're naturally reasonable creatures and rational activity is manifested in virtue. But 
the hedonists would go against that. And it, it seems like these these contemporary, and nothing's really new under the sun. This is what's interesting. These contemporary philosophers are really resurrecting that concept and making and and making it really complex. It, there, it's hard to understand the contemporary philosophers. They are super complex. So, um, uh, so basically it comes down to the bodily desires. And what is the strongest bodily desire? The strongest one, without a doubt, is a sexual urge, right? So it becomes to the point, it comes to the point where the sexual urge, right, becomes the, um, right, the ultimate fulfillment of man. And we see this very much kind of, uh, you know, underlined in Foucault. Spelled Foucault, by the way, but Foucault, you know, we'll say in the French way, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to chime in here. I know I dealt with a lot of things, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we could perhaps for clarity's sake juxtapose uh, two extremes here. One would be extreme asceticism and one would be extreme hedonism. And so extreme asceticism has a, a very interesting uh, history. Um, so some of the things that are recorded as having been done by people that went to war with their buddy, be it in the Orient or in the Western tradition, our jaws will drop, right? whether it's picking up maggots from rotting flesh, putting, in back, putting them back in and saying, eat what you have been given, uh, whether it's standing on top of a pole uh, uh, or living on top of a pole chained for, for possibly decades, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, living in a hole somewhere, uh, uh, wearing cloth shirts, uh, meaning that are really itchy, uh, sleeping on, on nails, all kinds of things. Uh, right? This has been well, well documented. And so the question, whipping, obviously, self-lacerating, all of that. So first, let's uh, ask ourselves, what, what possibly could be the thinking, and not to say the justification, but the thinking of uh, people that have done this? Be easy to dismiss all of them as complete loons, but not all of them were complete loons. Certainly, some uh, high uh, uh, saintly people and, and and super people were associated with this moment of extreme asceticism. It would seem that an individual past a certain point of development is able to think of themselves uh, as something other than their body, uh, and as um, a, a principle or a personhood such that such the values of which are at odds with the impetuses of the, the body. Really, I, I want to get closer and closer to truth and reality best as I understand it. I want to purify my mind, sanctify my heart, and yet my body the whole time simply wants to continue being an animal, right? It, it has its, its hungers and its thirsts and its lust and, and all of that. And no matter what heights I climb, in my own inner development, my body remains grounded, or at least that I think would be along the lines of the reasoning of uh, the extreme ascetics. And consequently, they wish to break their body, break their animal desires. And yet the pitfalls of that need not be stated. I am a, a kind of a extreme uh, a psychological distress, uh, obviously ill health, um, unbelievable sufferings, and ultimately, to what end? Because the body will not yield. I, whatever I do, I want to continue to breathe and I want to continue to eat or, or I need to continue to eat. All of those desires and drives will remain put regardless of what I do. Now we swing to the other end, which could be called something like what you mentioned, extreme hedonism or a mindless indulgence of the bodily impulses. Here, uh, I don't eat to live. I live to eat. Mm -hmm. I, I live to enjoy <laughs> the, the possibilities of enjoyment such that my body presents uh, to me. The body or uh, desire would be a state that accompanies the satisfaction of an objective. For example, I have an itch and I scratch it. So I have a little bit of desire. I want to win, uh, have money and I win the lottery. Oh, lots of, uh, lots of, uh, or did I say desire? I meant pleasure. Pleasure is, I didn't say that. Pleasure is the state that accompanies the satisfaction of desire. So lots of pleasure. Should I win the lottery? So the body presents a host of objectives, the satisfaction of which yields various degrees of pleasure. And it would seem that the more important the objective, the more pleasure. I'm starving and I eat. Oh, 
It was really good. I'm really thirsty and I drink. It feels really good. I'm not so thirsty. I'm not so hungry. And the meal also may not feel so great. And the beverage may not feel so good. So by asking myself, what desires, what objective does my body have? What desires does, it, does my body present to me? And then using my intellect to satisfy them, I can become, in effect, the slave of my body. And from morning to night, the extreme here, just because we are considering the extreme, the extreme would be simply, um, again, from moment to moment, trying to stimulate myself best I can. Uh, maybe I wake up immediately. How can I attain the pleasure? And then the next step and the next step, the extreme of this extreme would probably be um, drug use, right? It, it would be <clears throat> addictions here. Literally, right? I, I get a high. Um, it, it wears off. I feel horrible. And then I need another high. And then I need another high. Maybe gambling. Right? I feel good for a second. Oh, am I going to win? No. Again, I try. Again, I try. Right? So many of us, unfortunately, have fallen into the pits of such servitude and slavery to the corporal, and that's no go. I mean, it, it, it should somebody say, why? Well, I, why is it a problem? Well, for one thing, it's impossible because if we, uh, um, the, the satisfaction comes in, in a, after a negation, I get thirsty and then I drink. If I just keep drinking, the pleasure will be lost. If I just keep eating, there cannot be pleasure. If I just keep satisfying myself in certain other uh, corporal ways, there cannot be satisfaction. There has to be first a negation. There has to be rest. So that's it, it's impossible as it is. And it destroys us if we try. So one extreme does not work. Asceticism, uh, uh, extreme asceticism. I'm going to torture myself. I'm going to uh, impoverish my body and starve myself. And the other extreme does not work. I'm a slave of my body. What's the median here or the medium? It would seem to be to take uh, the desires uh, or the needs of the body take them for what they're worth, satisfy them in a reasonable way, and always be aiming for something higher, uh, for the higher human life. Make the lower subservient to the higher. I can eat, and with that energy, I can go do charity. I can do something good. I can drink, and then I can go also do something good or work out and exercise and make that subservient to something even higher and so forth and so on. I can uh, uh, try to regulate my uh, other corporal impulses and, and confine them to something that, uh, again, my reason tells me is appropriate, such as marriage. Um, and, and consequently, I can focus on being a human being and not a human animal without that extreme of trying to annihilate uh, uh, or beat my body at a game that my body certainly will win. Right? Breathe, eat, drink, enjoy, still in moderation and make it subservient to uh, higher values and higher purposes could be here a happy median to strike yeah no yeah there's definitely um very you know a lot of important issues you said there and um i think this is so fundamental that this is the basis of of the cultural political what have you crisis that we're, we're suffering today that that this monistic spirit um even uh more so than what you said uh, before kind of like you know there's a primacy of passions or you know passion is not used as a means it's used as an ends which which is okay also but it's not moderately sought it's it's, it's sought for end as itself and it's in, in a disordered right inordinate manner which in the end becomes right uh unpleasurable right it's not pleasurable at all in the end um but um I think it's more than that in the sense that the body, like we need, there's a, you know, and every time there's, there's a, a human need for redemption, right? There's a human need. And that's why, you know, Christianity is, well, man has a natural desire for religion in a sense as rede redemption, you know, revelation from God, man needs to be redeemed. So, you know, if, if, if he doesn't believe in true re re religion, I would say it's Catholicism then um he would make one up because we have a, a desire for revelation redemption in particular so it, because the body has totally absorbed the soul uh in, in the in philosophy the body has become the redemption right the body has become the redeeming factor we can say so I want to read something from Foucault, which I, th I thought was interesting. I think it's from his genealogy of power. It might be from his archaeology of knowledge. I'm not sure. But uh, Foucault, again, kind of had this spirit where he refers everything to the body. 
right? He believed that any any original and continuous reconstruction process of our culture has to begin with the body, or is at least related to the body. The body and the flesh, you know, the body and the flesh, right? We're, that's what we're talking about, the flesh. And he says this specifically. So he says here, quote, the flesh and all the things embedding into it, including food, climates, and earth, is where the source is. Just as the body generates desires, weaknesses, and faults, all the events in the past are also linked in the flesh and sometimes jostle against one another in the flesh. They would also dissolve, fight, and vanish with each other and pursue the insurmountable conflicts. Therefore, genealogy as a stream analysis is in the link between the body and history. So this, end quote. So this historical interpretation like this giving meaning to history as primarily a manifestation of of, of the of bodily desires. There, there's a lot of truth to that. Right? We do have wars. We do have you know all these other uh, you know these turmoils and and a lot of things you know things that happen throughout history, bad things because of disordered right evil. We would say human passions. Yes. So there's a lot of truth to that, but. As we as we said this as we talked about this before, because all the functions of man originate in the body, there is no room for any uh, mentalism. We can say Cartesian mentalism. There is no room to, um, you know, apply a certain function of man to the soul. So this is a logical consequence of the complex materialism which we're talking about in postmodernism. So it's interesting to say. That since the body, really history is interpreted as really history of a body, right? History of bodies, right? What they've been doing and how they've been responding. The salvation has to be in the body, right? In the flesh, the salvation in the body and is in the fulfillment of the body, as we were saying before, uh, absolutizing its its desires and as a redeeming um, uh, factor, we can say, as something that will redeem me. So I need to go away from the, you know, the rigid pure, uh, puritanism of the, um, you know, of the past, especially in medieval times and even in modern times with all this talk about virtue and dualism. And I need to focus on a monistic, um, a monistic view where the body is what I am, the body is what saves me, and the body is is how I how I am fulfilled ultimately, right? How do I serve my purpose? And and more concretely in fulfilling its desires. So yeah, it's really interesting how uh, uh I guess the question would be asked, well then why didn't why wasn't uh if if the history is seen, you know, if if history is seen in a negative sense, right, as a, a bunch of bodies together, right, how can salvation be through the body? Right. And then Foucault more likely would say, um, you know, if that question were posed to him, that really the body has kind of been suppressed, right? The body has been suppressed. And a lot of these right, contemporary philosophers will point to um, religion, right? Anything, actually, actually dualism also. Dualism, giving primacy to the soul, especially as the evil, as the, the, the main factor of evil. That has called it. So it's been, yes, there's there's only bodies, but because we haven't believed in that, because we had, because we were dualistic and we put the body in a subcategory, right, under the soul, that has brought out the evils in the past. But now we need to unleash the body. And this comes from the sexual revolution of the 60s. Uh, you know, that's a huge cultural manifestation because culture comes from philosophy. Philosophy, you know, definitely animates it. And, um, uh, so the body needs to be unleashed, and that is man's redemption, if that makes sense, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I would say one, one thing immediately that we could say would be that uh, it's a big mistake to think that it is possible to philosophize without, first of all, ordering one's personal life in one's inner life. I mean, if I'm in an unregenerate uh, uh, inner state, then whatever comes out of my mouth and whatever I think will be somewhere or another sleazy uh, 
attempt either to justify myself or to strive for superiority or to appease my guilt or whatever the case might be. That's why, say, we're reading uh, somebody and we know that this is a, a moral monster. And it, it's going to be, you know, read it if you want for educational purposes, but to hope to gain something uh, of genuine worth from it would be asking a lot. Right? If you read the manifesto, for example, of a school shooter, um, it, you're not going to be expecting to walk away with insights that you would expect to walk away with reading a Plato or a Platonist or somebody like that. Right? Because the it's, we think with our whole self, with our whole personhood, and we can't isolate one function such as the intellect and I can do whatever I want in my personal life and I can be a, a, a degenerate, right? And then I'm still gonna be able to think clearly and, and correctly, and, and especially on these essential themes, touching upon uh, the human condition, such as the relation of the body to the mind and all uh, of that. And so when we hear uh, then a, a person saying that, oh, I know for a fact there's nothing more to life than just the satisfaction of bodily impulses, the person is simply stating their own disability. I mean, just like if somebody tells me, uh, I know for a fact uh, that uh, there's no, um, there's only four senses, you know, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. I, that doesn't disprove my vision if I'm sighted. It simply proves they don't have vision, which is not a moral thing at all. It could be fine. You're congenitally blind, but just to, to make a point, right? If you say that there's no colors, it doesn't mean that there's no colors. I, I, I can see that there's colors if I'm not colorblind. It means that you're colorblind, um, uh, whoever's saying that. So when somebody makes these kinds of vulgar claims that, that fly in the face of uh, innumerable uh, uh, vast amounts of content from uh, saintly people, from geniuses, from saintly geniuses uh, that have striven for the higher human life right, and have given their life for their ideals and their values, it's, it's not even worth addressing. It's just, again, somebody t says uh, uh, there's no such thing as um, love, well, it's because for you, there's no such thing as love. Anybody, any mother that has a child that is not, you know, for the most part, knows that there is such a thing as love for a fact, right? because it's the way I feel towards my child, the way I feel towards my spouse. So, uh, anyhow, another point then that could be made would be that um, it, it, there's no use demonizing our uh, animal substratum. I, oh, it's so bad that I need to breathe and I need to eat and I need to drink and I need to use the restroom. I, uh, uh, the issue would be that we can, being homo sapiens, we can humanize our animality and so to say, weaponize it in a way that no other animal can. So for example, we share uh, many needs and, and impulses with chimps right, and gorillas and other primates and, and many, many other species of animals. A, a, a chimp, you take the banana from the chimp, the, the chimp probably is going to know that you took my banana. But the chimp cannot, uh, out of revenge, launch a, a, a big war. I mean, they do fight a little bit, but they can't launch a nuclear war. They're not smart enough to have weapons. Uh, a chimp out of greed cannot structure its whole life uh, a, a, a around greed right? a, a, in a way that we can. And for example, try to build a, a huge empire, the, the cartel empire, this and that, right? So we can weaponize, we can humanize uh, our um, uh, our animality, and that's where the danger comes from. And so, for example, uh, I have, again, objectives associated with the end of um, uh, reproductive ends, no problem, right? But I take that impulse, and instead of corralling it and using it appropriately within confines delineated by uh, cognition, by my intellect, I can let that run amok and I can uh, be a voluptuary. I can be a, um, a, a super hedonist and I can be, again, innumerable variants here, uh, perverse variants uh, that, that find their foundation in one general um, uh, initial animal impulse. And I can take my general desire for food, which in moderation is obviously necessary and phenomenal. And, and I can, uh, again, structure my whole life to eat. I can live to eat. Everything else is blotted out, and I simply uh, think about where is my next meal coming from, and how one. Not that I'm starving, but just because that's my main source of meaning in life. And the tragedy here is that, as far as it seems, the Homo sapien, the would-be human being, right, and 
meaning the homo sapien that does not do that and, and strives for humanity and, and is trying to be human as much as possible. Seems to have unlimited uh, potentialities, infinite capacities for the, the pursuit of truth, for love, for goodness. I, uh, and all of that entails self-sacrifice. It entails the control of our animality. And when we don't do that, I, uh, and we don't live a dying life, we're constantly trying to die to self, let, the, let the, our, our lower self die. Uh, then we live a, a living death. We're alive, and yet we're, we, we simply are here to observe our uh, degenerate inner state, our inner death, right? uh, our subservience and slavery to the lower. And that's what makes it so tragic. Uh, that a bonobo, a, a chimp, a gorilla lives as a primate is not at all tragic. That's normal. Nothing else can be expected from the primate. There's no other potentialities. If I can't fly, that's not a tragedy because I'm not meant to fly. I can't fly. If a bird can't fly, then that's a problem. So if the chimp lives like a, a chimp, like an animal, no problem. But if I live like a chimp, like an animal, it is a problem. And, and I'm going to be there to see that it is a problem. And I'm going to experience increasing levels of distress and disturbance and, and anxiety and, and degeneration and death. I, and that's the problem. So we can, again, take that approach of um, controlling or the necessities of our body in a moderate way and striving to develop an inner life that is aloof to the animal. Yeah, you know, um, talk about, you're basically justifying a dualism in a sound sense, uh, because when you, when you refer to rationality and really virtue is what you're alluding to, you, you're talking about the soul. Right, and this is classical, this perennial philosophy that the soul exists. Right, even mens, mentis in Latin, uh, we got mentality that is originally of you know of a of an immaterial, that's an immaterial a notion that that, that refers to immateriality or or suhe from psychology. Uh, psychology was originally philosophy that is the immaterial reality. So without a doubt, you know, classically speaking, and even in a sense, there's there's certain immediacies here like yes we do not we we do not immediately perceive what is not physical it does seem because you know we, we only uh you know we passively perceive the senses we, we immediately perceive the object of sense and since they're invisible they can't be by definition the object of sense so we can argue for them but in a sense there's a certain immediacy uh because there's a lack of something like for example as you alluded to death so the person's not there, right? I don't talk to Johnny's corpse. And Johnny, and, and this reduction, this material reduction is, is so absurd to say that Johnny is just, you know, the the all the conjoined biological functions in the body, the flowing of the blood, the beating of the heart, the multiplication of cells, what have you. Um, that that is Johnny. You know, it's, it's so absurd and it's so insulting. Um, and we do not even believe that a child himself realizes Johnny is gone, right? Johnny is not, is not there, right, in death. So there's there's certain something immediately, right, there to be known. But what's interesting with, with talking with, uh, you know, you know, what you're talking about using logic, the, the postmoderns, the contemporary philosophers, like Foucault said in his, uh, he had another work, I think it's called Madness, Madness and Civilization. Yeah, he said, um, I have a quote right here. The ultimate language of madness is that of reason. <laughs> it's just, and, and, and we talked about before how one extreme responds to another. This is the, the Hegelian dialect, right? Where, you know, you have the synthesis, antithesis, I'm sorry, thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. So really, history is a whole bunch of kind of contradictions offsetting each other. Uh, until something new comes out, and then that has a contradiction, and then so on and so forth. So really, because rationality has been so triumphant, um, it has been a it, it it is equated with tyrannical oppression, and it has culminated into the two world wars. Uh, I'm not promoting this. I mean, I'm not like I'm just stating this matter of factly. This is what the contemporary philosophers believe that being reasonable simply veils right it, or, you know it, what's underlying it is tyrannical oppression remember we have to see everything through the lens of power with the contemporary philosophers so what do we do 
We have to get away from that oppression by getting away from reason. So your arguments are all good. And, and, and that's the salvation, again, of man. We have to go back to the classical arguments. The problem with them is that they're totally deconstructionist. Who was a deconstructionist philosopher? Was it 14? No, De, uh, Derrida. Uh, deconstruction. Destroy. No, not construct. So it's... Uh, it's it's a denial of the past which without, without affirming anything positive is a denial of reason it's an irrationality and hence we turn to the body we turn to the bodily desires so they would say don't come with me so they would say nego mayorum you no know, in latin i deny your the major i deny the the, the in english you say the the well the, first, the they deny the premise ultimately um and not the premise of your arguments. I argued one time with a postmodernist, and he he would argue against me. Um, uh, well, he would argue with me against the uh, principle of non-contradiction, which is the fundamental principle of logic. You know, two things cannot coexist, or well, no, two contradictions cannot be. One thing cannot be and not be at the same time in the same sense. I cannot exist and not exist at the same time in the same sense. So he was arguing against that. So I was like, how can you, well, as Aristotle said, I mean, this is an inherent contradiction to, to philosophize, you, to, no, to deny philosophy, you have to philosophize. To be an anti-philosopher, you have to be a philosopher. So it's an inherent contradiction. But you see how deep to the, uh, how deep seated this is. And another thing you allude to, this is interesting, it seems to be, um, because really the last level of sin, of disorder, is its justification, especially its rational justification. So they rationally justify irrationality, the ultimate contradiction. Right? This is really the sin against, we can say this, the philosophical sin against the Holy Spirit, right? where you're, you're, you, know, you cannot be saved right, philosophically because you have, you have denied yourself so fundamentally. So it's, and it goes to the point where Foucault, he humanizes any type of behavior, especially sexual deviant behavior. He wrote a, another work, I see right here. Yeah, the history of sexuality, right? He argues that the demonization of the sexual, uh, the sexual other reveals the petty tyrannical insecurity of the sexual majority. So also because Foucault is a Marxist, he, he passes on that, the Hege, again, based on the Hegelian dialect of the oppressor and oppressed, he passes that from the economic realm to, to the sexual realm. Really, that, that sex and the body, the body too, more fundamentally, the body has been oppressed by the soul. It's the soul. The souls are like the, the capitalists, the capitalists, and the bodies are, you know, the poor working class. And now we need to reverse those roles where the body comes up top and really imposes on the soul, which he wouldn't even believe existed. And, it, you know, it imposes its, its um, you know, its desires. And again, as a, as, a, as a type of redemption for man, this is the minority that needs to rebel, needs to re revolutionize violently. And hence we have the sexual revolution. And hence we have this anti-Western, anti-Christian, um, you know, mentality so prevalent today. Right, very much founded on Foucault. And um, yeah, I don't know if you want to say some closing remarks, we can end it here. Yeah, yeah some fascinating points, Professor. Um, I think we could perhaps give a slight stab towards uh, the, the initial kind of point of trying to reconcile uh, uh, the fact that whereas uh, 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 corporal monism has too many issues to be uh, realistic, a realistic option as to truth, as to how things work. Also, the classical dualism uh, uh, of mind and body also has innumerable issues. Uh, again, that I have a mind that is different uh, than the body. So what could be said on this account? Perhaps one suggestion would be that, first of all, we take any and all content of any sort, and we place it on the same epistemic footing. We don't give anything priority, right? any kind of content. Again, be it that we call it experience or we call it reality or we call it thought or we call it 
motion, physical motion, whatever it might be, we place them on the same footing of knowledge to ourselves, And then we simply consider the fact on the ground as to how an individual develops. And the fact on the ground seems to reveal that we begin life in a way such that can be described as that of a creature, as a baby. Um, there's a reason to think that a baby certainly can feel heat and cold and hunger and thirst and all of that, but there's yet no self as later on may come about. No, if uh, barring certain um, kind of uh, issues that unfortunately may take somebody out of the race, and hopefully the baby becomes a toddler and the toddler becomes a kid and a preteen and a teen. And the proper process of development is, and also to mention, you mentioned that uh, so-called Hegelian dialectic, which I think philosopher Fichte, however you would pronounce it, Johan Fichte actually originated it, but it, it is typically associated with Hegelianism. Um, here, that dialectic could be something like that. We, um, here's myself, whatever it is. I'm a little five-year-old uh, kid uh, and, and uh, I like blocks and here's mommy, here's daddy, hopefully this and that. Uh, so there, and there's the non-self. Uh, there's uh, uh, the bigger kid on the playground. There's the toy that I don't have. There's the idea that I don't understand. There's the place that I haven't been to. Uh, so then we take it and we assimilate it to ourself. We make it a part of ourself. It's like the body, in order to make use of food, it has to uh, convert it. A big issue, um, <laughs> medical issues, that people can't uh, properly use nutrients because the nutrients remain themselves. They retain their identity and the body we cannot convert them and use them for its own purposes. So I can have a lot of vitamin C, B, D, but it's pointless if my body can't convert it. So I can be exposed to all kinds of experiences, but unless I can turn that material into myself, so to say, then uh, it's pointless. That's why uh, you know you can take a dog all over the world and take it to the best art galleries and expose it to every kind of experience, but the dog will remain a dog because there's no latent potentiality to grow uh, as a principle of individuality. But by the way of our species, there is obviously that potentiality. Again, as a matter of fact, without any speculation, there is that potentiality. I do have a principle of individuality. And if I take that, which is at present my not self, and I, uh, I conform myself to it, right? with food, I have to conform the food to myself. The food has to die for me to live. For me to, to live, there's a cow. Well, I have to, unfortunately, you know, goodbye cow and, and welcome burger or steak or whatever it might be. Goodbye plant if I'm a vegetarian and welcome the plant burger or the, the broccoli or whatnot with ideas and with truth, I have to die in, in, in relation to the ideas and the truth. Here's a truth that I don't like. I have to assimilate it. Uh, I have to conform myself, assimilate myself to it, right? So if, if we go through that process correctly, then we, again, as a matter of fact, without any speculation, we uh, expand as an individual. We go from being a tiny little point of selfishness and self-seeking and self-centeredness to a whole world, um, a whole reality, to so say, within which uh, the phenomena appear, and yet, right, not at the exclusion of the reality of the phenomena. Right? So we're not going to either take a, a, some kind of strange uh, monistic uh, mentalism. Oh, here's just my mind. We don't know. My, right? If there's only mind, then the word mind has no meaning. If there's only matter, the word matter has no meaning. For all intents and purposes, we can uh, divide our experience and say by the word matter, we mean something, for example, through which my hand will not reach, uh, something that my thoughts do not modify, right? I have a, a thought of um, uh, Mount Everest. So I can uh, visualize Mount Everest and then I can turn it into gold in my mind or make it gold colored, but it will not change uh, uh, my potential experiences of that which I consider to be the real Mount Everest. So we can certainly make that division on a level, right? but ultimately, uh, as was mentioned, we say everything we take on the same epistemic footing. We don't know what it is in any ultimate way. We can't define it outside of itself or take something outside of experience or reality to define experience or Reality, what we can clearly see that there are principles of individuality, what we call uh, selves, and we can uh, uh, make some progress towards clarifying what it takes to be happy and healthy selves, which includes, I think, some of the elements perhaps mentioned and obviously uh, uh, many others, but certainly it does not include uh, uh, becoming a slave, uh, a servant 
the, the corporal impulses. It does not include uh, denying the corporal impulses and going the other route of trying to enfeeble myself physically and consequently mentally. No, I want to have the strongest and healthiest body that I can. So to have the strongest and healthiest mind that I can. And then I want to use that mind to pursue the truth, to do good, to do right, and consequently grow uh, 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 as an individual. And whatever my destiny is, it is, right? And, and hopefully we'll find out. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, you're definitely, you know, anti-contemporary philosopher, uh, right? Um, or philosophy you're, you're talking about there. Um, because really the denial of self is rooted in modern philosophy and, you know, it's very much, uh, very much exists in um, like extreme existentialism, which is part of contemporary philosopher from Sartre, for sure. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, this, this awareness of self, this awareness of individuality, this awareness of personhood, which cannot be communicated, right? Um, you know, I can communicate my human nature. But not my individualized human nature, which is individualized by my personhood. So I cannot, com you know, I cannot uh, communicate Raphaelness. Right? Yes, humanity, I can, but this individualized human, which is Raphael, cannot be communicated. So much so in, in you know Catholic doctrine, in the Trinity, we teach that you know they share one nature, but they're they're distinct by the person. So they they, they have individuation uh, through. Per, their personality so that the father cannot give fatherhood to the son the son cannot you know give sonship back to the father or give sonship to the holy spirit so they are unique persons but they share everything except for that personality which makes them right they, they're indivi this individual and um and we do have an immediate internal awareness and this is interesting because we uh, you know we never we never really feel disembodied. Like there's an internal self awareness of our body. So even though, you know, um, you know, external perceptions flow, they come and go. Really, the inner sensory flow, you can say, in our bodies, it is not even controlled by us. I mean, there's something there that I have this inner self awareness that that seems to go beyond any type of you know, or merely reducing it to a simple, you know, biological explanation. There's something there. And and my individuation, my individuality, what makes me an individual, something that it cannot be repeated, something incommunicable, is also um, something that, that would that would seem to be, uh, you know, that, that would seem to refer to, to, to an immaterial reality. Um, you know, even though no two physical things are alike, fair enough, but the the human person is so complex and so individualized in many, you know, it, it, just in many in in many small factors and many you know character traits and different temperaments that it seems it would have to be based, really eradicated in in an immaterial element to, as the soul. So yeah, it's really um, again the problem is you can. You can see, seemingly reduce everything to the body, but it's really, I like to be consequentialist. I mean, the consequences of that, I think that really helps in philosophy to be consequentialist saying, well, what, um, which is the, uh, well, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of saying, uh, I forget the name of the followers, it's a fallacy where you say you take the per the opponent's argument as true. And you say, if your argument was true, then I forget what's, what it's called. Um, but you take the opponent's argument as true and you say, if you were right, then this, this, and this, and this. So really from the consequences, you can know that it's false, right? The, the, the most true consequences, the best consequences and the consequences that point to the good really are the, are the ones in their root that the reasons are, are those are the ones. That, <laughs> so, but anyway, um, yeah, if you want to end it here, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, sure. No, good points, Professor. Um, yeah, I think uh, that is a, a, a practical tool. See uh, if there's a discrepancy between what a person says and how their life is. All right. So let's say uh, no a prominent speaker immediately comes to mind that says there's no such thing as an individual. There's just each moment, right? Okay, you have kids. So each moment that you see your kid, don't acknowledge that this is your kid. That was your kid a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. 
that is somewhere in, in their given uh, point of development as it concerns education and character. This is just moment to moment, right? So, uh, you know, it's a new, every moment it's a new kid. You can give them a new name every moment. You can uh, start teaching them random words from random languages. It really doesn't matter, right? It's just a given moment. So we see that that would be absolutely criminal. Obviously, we assume that there is a single uh, principle of individuality that can be affected by what you teach the kid and how you treat the kid and so forth. You were my kid yesterday. You're my kid today. And hopefully uh, it, it, you'll be my kid uh, uh, tomorrow. You're in first grade. You're not going to all of a sudden become a, a, a senior in high school mentally, emotionally, and maturity-wise overnight. You can have some some jumps a little bit, but not like that, right? Just like physically, uh, I, I have to contend with my buddy, take it, uh, uh, take myself where I'm at physically and hit the gym and, and get in shape and build some muscle and lose some fat. I can't just deny the individuality of my body. I can't just say, oh, my body, your body, it's all the same. All the bodies are the same. I don't really have a body. Do I really have a body? No, I do have a body and I should take care of it and I should work out and I should eat healthy. So if I take some of these uh, devious steps to deny my personhood and deny my individuality, because for many reasons, right? Uh, if I never work out, and you know, there's a lot of stuff here that gravity can hold on to. I probably don't want to take off my shirt. I don't want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, my body, right? I, if I have all kinds of health issues, I don't want blood works necessarily. So. I don't acknowledge myself. I live a degenerate lifestyle or I just ignore myself and there's all kinds of disorder and all kinds of issues that come up. I don't want to acknowledge myself. So I deny myself. I, uh, I'm i nothing more than uh, my brain or an epiphenomenon of my brain. Uh, I don't exist at all. It's just a given moment, all this nonsense. And instead I do acknowledge uh, uh, my individuality. It exists to some extent and, and it has some continuity to some extent. I have to deal with myself as much as necessary. Uh, the analogy physically something hurts deal with it until it doesn't hurt and i don't think about it something hurts mentally emotionally i have uh, given issues deal with those issues until i don't think about it i and that's the difference also between so-called self-help and, and a truly kind of a devout uh, human life uh, which is focused on self-sacrifice and moving towards the good it's not about me making myself perfect so i can think oh i'm so perfect and I, i'm so uh, psychologically uh, enlightened, this and that. It's about taking care of my inner exigencies so that I can turn myself to something higher than myself. I mean, I'm constantly stressed and anxious, ask myself why, try to take care of that. I mean, a, a lame is healthy, I'm not thinking about it. I'm healthy as a self, I'm not thinking about myself. Not because I deny myself or ignore myself, but because I align myself with truth and therefore I don't need to think about myself. So again, in summary, I think, again, take our individuality seriously, whatever the um, uh, speculation here might be. People have been speculating about the body and the mind and the relation between the two and all of that for millennia. Uh, and, and we can't expect that, you know, there's going to be a perfect solution and we can't wait around for there to be a perfect solution. We can't wait. Okay, first of all, I have to know all of this and then I'm going to work on myself. Start from the bottom where I'm at and climb up, not from the top down, from the bottom up, take myself as I am and, and, and work myself out properly and, and become what it is that I'm able to be, regardless of uh, how that would be classified uh, philosophically.